very close. here on the scholarship, just out of curiosity, almost a, half, a third to half. It's, well, congratulations on, uh, on getting that. And yeah, we need to get more on it. Um, what I'm going to talk about, I have uh, about 45 minutes because I do want to save a few minutes at the end for some questions, is I'm going to focus in later in the talk on the strategy for cyberspace security. But what I'd first like to do is kind of build up a, a case for why we need it. So the things I'm going to look to here is I'm going to set the stage <coughs> talk about some history, then look at the uh, events of September 11th last year that led to the creation of our office, the, uh, the executive order that stood us up, a little bit about our office, and then I'll focus in on the strategy itself. That'll be the bulk of what we'll talk about today. And then towards the end, I want to throw out some ideas for you as uh, InfoSec researchers, which I presume many of you see yourself in that light while you're here at school, and uh, carry that thought process as you go forward in your careers, and some closing thoughts. I can briefly talk about Homeland Security if you'd like, but that would actually be another two or three hours if, um, if you want, so we'll try and stay focused just on cyber. First, a couple of quotes. Looking back to last year, Dr. Rice was uh, addressing a group of people at a security policy forum, and she brought up an interesting point that uh, cyberspace security and everything that works around it is really like a classic deterrence mission. It has to do with understanding the fact that your enemy will always go after your soft and your weak and uh, your vulnerable points. And in fact, in the United States, uh, the way we're set up with our infrastructures, the cyber side is sort of our, our soft underbelly. But in order to begin protecting ourselves against it, we have to recognize that that's a problem. It's almost like an alcoholic admitting that he is an alcoholic, and then you can take the next steps towards, uh, towards doing that. For many, many years, our nation would not recognize that we were vulnerable. We were just building and creating. The internet was happening, the World Wide Web, etc. cetera. Um, but it's, there was a turning point in the late 90s, and I'll talk about that in a few slides, where we actually did come to the group with the fact that we are vulnerable. So this was very good. We, we have now passed that point and are working on it. The president last summer also uh, addressed the concept of cyber terrorism in the context of small nations that would like to upset the United States and other large nations can't do it kinetically. They certainly don't have the ability to launch a full-scale invasion or a war against the United States in a physical sense, but they can come after us with chemical, biological, uh, possibly even nuclear powers, and cyber terrorism. If you notice, he points that out as well. So the president has also recognized at his level that this is an issue. And he is uh, continues to be quoted on his awareness of um, cyber problems. A few weeks ago, we had a, a little incident with the root DNS servers. Some of you may have uh, heard about it or took a, a liking to this. All 13 of them came under a sustained flood, an ICMP, like a ping flood, for about an hour. This was on a late Monday afternoon, about 5 p.m. East Coast time. Uh, it started very suddenly, and it stopped very suddenly, which indicates some type of control mechanism. It's not based on clocks that are in computers, it's because clocks tend to always trip quite a bit, but within a few seconds of starting, everything was going full scale, and within a few seconds it stopped. Remarkable. Well, it, except for the fact that it was leaked to the press, the general public probably would have never known that. The root service kept working just fine, everybody got their AOL, they were able to trade on eBay, get their stocks, read sports scores, no, no interference to the internet. But one of our people who was chasing the problem dropped some email to an AP reporter who did some more investigations, turned it into a story, and of course the press ran with it. Ari Fleischer was asked, that's the um, press uh, advisor to the president, uh, a day or so later at his daily press conference, is this cyber terrorism? Is this what we're seeing? Is this Al-Qaeda doing something, doing the deed to us? And of course Ari, being you know, well-versed on uh, cyber matters, had some very good answers. And again, he points to the fact that we're aware of problems in cyberspace. We, we understand the issues. Uh, we've already figured out what's wrong. We are taking steps to protect it. And in fact, 
watching what happens to the DNS is that they can take this type of flood with very little to no effect on the internet is an example of some of the resiliencies that have been put into place. Well, this turning point occurred in 1997. A somewhat less significant turning point had happened back in 82. For those of you that remember your history, that was the year that the um, federal government told AT&T to divest itself, to break up, uh, which happened in 1984. Prior to 82, there had been only one large phone company in America. As a result of consolidation back before World War II and through the middle part of the last century, AT&T had emerged as pretty much the single telephone provider, with the exception of small local companies, but they had all the long distance. They were broken up in 82. The government faced a, a significant problem then as to what do we do? How do we function in a world where there used to be one monolithic company and now there's many? So even then, in early 82, we're starting to realize that our telecommunication system, upon which this very, very young internet was being built, was going to have problems in this sense economically and within the company. So steps were put into place in the early 80s to build redundancies in the system, to provide the government with alternate means of communication to do things in a world where there are many companies. So as we grew through the 80s and in the early 90s and the internet exploded and we had the World Wide Web, many of those lessons learned early on, and even back to the 60s, you can trace some through the Cold War, were kind of working and working well. But what we didn't realize was how interdependent and how dependable we were upon cyber networks. In the fall of 97, the President's Commission was finished. It's a 15-month study known as the Mars Commission that took a look at all the critical infrastructures across the nation, not just cyber, but gas and oil, transportation, uh, finance, and others. It came up with a report that said, we're extremely vulnerable. We have all these systems that can protect themselves individually, but they're very, very interdependent of each other. And we need to do something about it. The President looked at the reports, this is President Clinton, yep, you're right, now we need to do something about it, and life goes on. Not a whole lot of attention is paid to the report immediately. At the same time, a DOD eligible receiver exercise was conducted in late 1997. This uh, lasted a few weeks, largely driven by red teams out of NSA poking around inside the DOD networks, came to the same conclusion. DOD's computer networks, extremely vulnerable, extremely interconnected. I can go from the internet all the way up to, J to JWIX. I can do lots of things I really shouldn't be able to do inside of DOD networks. This report comes out, a meeting is held in the Pentagon in the tank, several generals around the table. Oh my God, oh dear, what are we going to do? Finger goes around the room, who's in charge? Nobody could really accept responsibility for this problem. The question comes back up, yeah, but wasn't this theoretical? I mean, wasn't this artificial? It's really just a red team. Not yet, it's just a red team. So do we really need to do something about it? Yeah, eventually. We'll do something about it eventually. The clock becomes 1998, it's now February of 98, and uh, we are launching some airstrikes over Baghdad in response to the fact that they had violated the no-flight zone uh, with the uh, northern part of Iraq. Uh, they had sent some weapons inspectors home, a whole bunch of things that added up to where we were going to do the deed to Iraq. At the same time, some system administrators and a couple of Air Force installations discovered weird things going on with computer networks begin to dig into it, and in fact, they're finding hackers breaking into the Air Force networks, not in one location, but many locations. And not just the Air Force, but across NASA and other government sites, the Army, the Navy, all at the same time that seem to be somewhat correlated with what we're doing in Iraq. So now, again, a group of generals gathers in the tank in the Pentagon that says, hey, remember this theoretical thing we had last fall, eligible receiver? Are we now seeing this today as the theoretical become practical? That case became known as Solar Sunrise. As the investigation proceeded, it turned out it was a couple of teenagers working out of California who were actually doing this problem inside the Air Force networks. As the case continued to develop, though, it turned out there was a connection to Israel and an Israeli hacker that was also working, and it possibly went deeper than that, which then remains still classified. But the point being is that we had this wake-up call a few, weeks, or a few months after a study had shown that we were weak. From there, the generals decided to do something about it. In the finger around the room, who's in charge? Nobody could really figure out who's in charge. Is this a DISA problem? Is it a service problem? Is it so common that you do something? Who, who takes responsibility? The idea that came from that was to create a joint task force, JTFC and the Joint Task Force for Computer Network Defense. That was established at the end of 1998, uh, put in Washington, D.C., housed underneath the DISA roof but also eventually assigned from the Secretary of Defense to Space Command. They've since become a Joint Task Force Computer Network Operations, JTFC, and I know you're probably familiar with that organization. 
one of the first things they worked on was the Moonlight Maze investigation, similar to Solar Sunrise, except very attributable to a foreign nation, not two hackers in California who were also raiding DOD defense systems. Um, they never came to a conclusion with Moonlight Maze as to exactly who was doing it, but uh, the case is closed, but the activity continues. Uh, we still see Moonlight Maze type activity inside our defense and government networks today. The big thing that came out of the President's uh, commission was PDD 63, Presidential Decision Directive 63, also uh, spring of uh, 1998. And in this PDD, which was a, a remarkable document, is the recognition of these sectors, sectors of the economy and interdependencies that were called out in the presidential document and then assigned to different parts of the government. For example, the Department of Energy would work with the electric power sector, treasury, with banking, and finance. And we also created four brand new government organizations. Many of these names should be familiar to you. And I'll talk to each of them very briefly. Uh, the infrastructures that were created, we can see on this slide the classic ones, but we've had a few new ones that have come up. For example, the food industry uh, wasn't thought of in 1998 as a critical infrastructure, but when you think about food, manufacturing, and delivery, that's very critical to our way of life. Uh, satellite communications. At first was thought that's a telecom problem, but in fact, there's a lot more to SATCOM than just relaying uh, telephone signals. There's the building and launching of the uh, spacecraft themselves. There's the steering and control of them. And many of the satellites don't carry TV or, or, uh, or uh, telephone signals. They're used for mapping. They're used for G uh, GPS. Many things besides just telecom. So we're looking seriously at making satellite communications a separate sector. Uh, hotel, restaurants, uh, recreation. Not thought of as a sector in 1998 may very likely become a sector now because we recognize that's part of our American way of life. The ability to do leisure and recreation. And do we want some adversary upsetting our hotel and restaurant system or hotel reservation systems? I mean, we can go on and on and on, but all of them are critical to the way we do business economically in our way of life. Running as a thread through all these sectors, though, is cyberspace. You didn't no notice there was not a sector called cyberspace. But through all of them, that becomes almost a fundamental uh, connection point. And that's the point where we have found the largest amount of weaknesses. The NIPC was set up at the FBI in uh, 1998 to act as a nexus of information that would come from across industry and government, feeding it information on vulnerabilities, exposures, attacks, uh, new weaknesses found in software and processes could then turn that information out and make uh, alerts and warnings to both the general public as well as the private sector and government. They, along with three other organizations, the FedCERC, the NCS, the National Communications System, and the CHOW, I'll talk about CHOW in just a minute, those four organizations will be taken away from their parent organizations. Uh, this spring will become part of the Department of Homeland Security. They will become a complete director that does information sharing and analysis, so we'll now consolidate four organizations that have watch centers and analysis teams into one. Uh, we still will have the problem of what to do with information that comes in from above top secret all the way down to open source, things we can read off the internet and then we can uh, on websites. How do you take that information and synthesize alerts and warnings that can go both to the general public as well as to top secret or higher installations? That's going to be a big challenge for them. <coughs> it's one of the first things they're going to have to work on solving. The PDD also created one ISAC in the PDD, but it turned out that many ISACs were the right way to go. An ISAC is a, could be a virtual organization or it could be a physical location with employees, but the idea is to do information sharing. We recognize this is probably being one of the biggest things we were doing wrong in America. We knew where we were vulnerable, we knew where we had exposures, we knew where the problems were, but we didn't do a real good job of telling other people that. The folks, for example, within the finance industry, if I worked at First Union Bank, and I had somebody break into my bank and steal a million dollars, whatever, electronically hijacked it, I would work that problem very privately with law enforcement, perhaps Secret Service. Hopefully they could, uh, would put cuffs on the guy. In most cases they didn't. And I would go and find out what went wrong, patch the systems, close the uh, vulnerabilities, and be done with it. But I would never go over and, tur and tell Citicorp or Citibank or Bank South or any of the countless other banks that might have the very same problem in their networks that caused somebody to break into my network. The financial services ISAC now takes that problem, and if I have a problem in First Union, they can send it to that ISAC. The ISAC can then strip out the attribution and share it amongst the other financial members so they can go look for the same problem in their systems and fix them immediately. 
the financial life stack can then take that information, strip off the fact that it's a bank or a trading house or a brokerage or wherever it came from, and send it to the NIPC, who can correlate it with problems over transportation or energy or telecom, and then bring all that together and synthesize what's really going on from the broader picture. So it's a really neat model. In 1998, it made a lot of sense. It worked very well pretty much through Y2K, but since the early part of 2000, this information sharing model has been dissolving a lot of it based on the downturn in the economy because companies are really not very willing to put a lot of money into these ISACs when they're having to lay off employees and cut back on other expenditures. One of the things we've always looked at is to keep the government out of the ISACs. So it would be purely industry-driven. The only thing that's government is the NIPC. Uh, we're taking a hard look at that now and thinking maybe we should put government funding into the ISACs even though the government doesn't have a person there. That way that seed money keeps the ISAC flowing so we can still have the information flow. The control of the ISACs will all move to Homeland Security uh, next spring. The CHAO office, also another PDD creation, was intended to do outreach and coordination. Outreach to the private sector, coordination within the federal government. They've had some limited successes. Uh, they've had some uh, bad press as well. But one of the best things they've come up with is a thing called Project Matrix. If you go to the website, you can read a little more about it. But what Project Matrix has done is taken all the different infrastructures from a physical perspective, put them into a spreadsheet, for lack of a better term, and looking for those crossover points. Where does a railroad carry a fiber optic cable on the same right of way that's over a bridge across the Mississippi River, for example, that's subject to flood damage when the Mississippi floods? Is there a problem with that? And if there is, is there a redundancy, like 100 miles up the river, where I can alter out that traffic? Uh, what about oil pipelines, for example, that come out of uh, southeast Texas? Are they traveling on common rights of way before they split across the rest of North America? Or are they divergent coming out of Houston from the start? Uh, here on the west coast, your water supplies that come out of the mountains. How many of them carry water on, on common rights of way that might be shared with other infrastructures that could be damaged, which would then damage water, which has this cascading effect? So, that matrix approach has discovered just countless vulnerabilities in our critical systems, and now we can go back to the owners of those systems and look for solutions. The one group that was called for by the PED that never happened was the NIAC. Um, it had a whole bunch of false starts. Uh, we thought right at the end of the Clinton administration we could get this going. The idea was to create an advisory council that could advise the president on how to do this infrastructure type protection, very senior level CEOs of companies type, type organization. Never got started, so in the executive order that created my office, which I'll talk about in a moment, we put the NIAC back in there, we just changed the name. So instead of being National Infrastructure Assurance Council, it became known as the National Infrastructure Advisory Committee. Uh, that way we can get it past the lawyers, you know, it's not the same group, but a different name, but it has the same acronym, you know, whatever works, that's politics in D.C. Uh, just this past week, this group has been stood up. Uh, we've got the, uh, the announcements to go to whitehouse.gov, not .com, but .gov. <laughs> you know what happens if you go to .com? Yeah. If you don't know, you don't need to know. Uh, go to whitehouse.gov, and you can see the list of the people who are, are now newly appointed to NIAC. I know you all agree. Okay, .com is a porno site. <laughs> no, we don't run it. <laughs> so, <laughs> nor did the previous administration. So we bring this <laughs> up to September 11th. We were waiting on this huge cyber attack. You know, we'd spent lots of time hardening our systems, expecting the bad guys to come after the soft underdog, to go after the DNSs, to uh, find all the uh, uh, peering points, the, the business exchange locations. What the bastards do, they go off and hit us in a place we're not looking. They hit us with a physical attack. I mean, up to this point, all the terrorism oriented on the United States was offshore. You know, embassy bombings, uh, ship bombings, like coal, for example, car bombs, truck bombs, all this, but in other countries, never in the United States. Anything that was here domestic, like the bombing of the, um, the building in Oklahoma City, was generally a, a U.S. citizen with some grief, grievance, not a offshore terrorist group. So when this happened, this was really kind of caught us off guard. A huge amount of lessons learned, as you can imagine. I'm going to talk about one of them right now. Is there a laser pointer down here? Probably not. Okay, don't worry about it. It's easier just to point. But <laughs> take a look at the, the middle center of the screen. You can see the pads of the World Trade Center. Uh, Tower 1 and Tower 2 are identified. But what I want to focus on is 140 West Street, upper left-hand corner. That's where the Verizon building sits. The Verizon's downtown central office for Lower Manhattan. 
Most large cities in, in America have two major telephone switching centers. These go back to the old AT&T days. Um, and they'll be far enough apart from each other, the idea being if one failed, the other one can pick up the load until it. But not a physical failure, but more of an electronic failure, say a, a power bank goes out or some batteries burn out. You know, that type of thing they can deal with. Um, Washington's like that. I'm sure this area here in Monterey probably has too many of the uh, across America. Well, this one just happened to be located next to the World Trade Center. Notice also how far away the New York Stock Exchange is. When the buildings came down, if you look on the left side, you can see the, the remains of, of Tower 2, and kind of in the middle is the remains of Tower 1. Over here on the right-hand side, you can see the remains of Tower 7. When Tower 2 came down, it came straight down. I'm sure most of you remember that from the videotape. It, it, it telescoped in on itself. When Tower 1 fell about a half hour, 45 minutes later, the upper part of it twisted off to the side. The lower part came straight down, but the upper part actually fell off to the right and hit World Trade Center 7, scarring it up very badly on the outside and setting it on fire. World Trade Center 7 suffered so much damage that later that evening, it also collapsed. Now, when it came down, this road here, running behind World Trade Center 7 and behind the Verizon building, you can see it sticking up there, carried most of the conduits for Lower Manhattan, all the fiber optic cable bundles, other infrastructure that's feeding the Verizon building. So as 7 comes down, the I-beams and steel and concrete are coming out of this building almost like darts and arrows, many of them penetrating the sidewalk. And in many cases, large bundles of fiber optic cable were just completely severed by Building 7 as it collapsed. Underneath all this, as you can imagine, there's a tremendous amount of flooding because the fire department is trying to put out the fires. Um, this is all the old um, Hudson River roughly ran across, you see these buildings here, about the front side of that building used to be the beach a couple hundred years ago. And then the rest from there out to the current Hudson River, which you can see up on the screen, is all filled. So when you have this amount of physical damage, you can imagine what it does to the seals of these buildings and what's underground. So the Hudson River now is also starting to flood back in, trying to reclaim where it flowed naturally. What all this does is when you have underground cabling, be it fiber optic or copper or whatever, it doesn't like water. And things tend to short out. So not only do you have physical damage on top of the street, but you've got massive amounts of water and physical damage below, far in excess of what anybody imagined would ever happen. So again, having one switching center here and another one a couple of miles up the peninsula as a redundancy doesn't work when there's this much physical damage. This is a, a closer view of uh, World Trade Center 7. You can see its, its damage here. And it goes up almost to the fourth floor of the Verizon building. So you can see the amount of damage it caused on the outside. And if you look on the inside, this is inside the Verizon building. Quite a few of the switching rooms themselves suffered damage as parts of 7 came flying in through the windows. But as a testament to the resiliency of the equipment, there was uh, several of these phone switches were actually hanging out the window, working off of battery power and still switching phone calls. <laughs> the only thing holding them up is the tensile strength of the cable, and the actual insulation of the cable holding this thing up. Um, underneath the Pentagon, where the aircraft hit the Pentagon, the, uh, the Pentagon was wired with uh, two entry points into the Nipper and Sipper nets, east side and west side. The, the aircraft hit the west side the router directly, or router bank directly underneath the aircraft continued to function. Uh, it lost power as that part of the Pentagon went dark on power, immediately shut over, uh, cut over the batteries, but continued to work. Somebody crawled through there with literally an orange extension cord and carried the power, plugged in so it continued to have power, all the way up to when they had removed the debris, including the aircraft, and they were able to get out these routers, still functioning and still working. So it's amazing how much has actually physically been built into our switching systems they can survive this type of impact. But we found in Lower Manhattan that the phone systems, when you, when you physically cut cables, obviously phone systems don't work. There's just not a whole lot you can do there. But the internet, which can route around things like that, work just fine. And many of the employees in Lower Manhattan were using AOL Instant Messenger or MSN or Yahoo Instant Messenger to message each other around Lower Manhattan because a phone service was out. Again, a testament to what we built with this mindset back in the 60s of building an IP-based network that can route around physical destruction. The thought in the 60s was nuclear bombs, not terrorist attacks, but it actually worked. The cellular system failed miserably, as you can imagine. If the towers come down, cell towers come down, cell phones don't work. But many tall buildings in New York City have redundant cell towers. The problem they had, there were so many people trying to use their cell phones 
there's a finite number of channels on each tower if it's saturated and wouldn't work. The unexpected consequence of this was that the New York City Fire Department, Police Department, Utilities, and others had become reliant on commercial cell phones as a way to call their counterparts in these other companies. If I'm an engine company 45 and I've got a buddy over an engine company 40, trying to go through the radio trunking system to get a hold of my buddy is painless. I know the cell phone, I'll just call them. They have become accustomed to doing that, but if the cell system collapsed, that doesn't work. So the priorities in lower Manhattan became, of course, rescue anybody who's alive, but right after that, get a communication system on the ground that the first responders can use. In particular, get these cellular on wheels, CALs, and many of them were brought in and set up. Third, uh, third thing to do was to get the stock market up and running. This is what, how they did the cable repairs. This is at street level. It's not underground. You can see the, the street poles over there to the left, the light poles. Uh, a lot of lower Manhattan looked like this for the next several weeks until they could get into the subterranean chambers, pump the water out, uh, remove the physical damage. So you had these, these cables running all over lower Manhattan. Quite a bit of uh, damage and lessons learned. So right after September 11th, uh, the White House created two new organizations. One that's gotten quite a bit of press, of course, is the uh, Office of Homeland Security. And a week after that, our office, the President's Critical Infrastructure Protection Board, was created. We were, uh, we've always been small, 15 people approximately uh, that's on the board staff. And then we have membership from the 26 other federal agencies, mostly the CIO type uh, members. Uh, the board itself only meets periodically, maybe once a month. The rest of us that do the staff work are coordinating with the agencies in terms of not only federal, but also the private sector, industrial, um, education side, cyber awareness, and cyber security. Central to the theme, though, was that we would ultimately create a cyberspace security plan, some type of strategy, some way forward for the nation. Some of the, the way we fit in, of course, a, a government briefing is not complete, but some type of uh, line chart here. You can see us in the middle. Uh, half of us, the piece that I work for, uh, sits actually with the National Security Council and then in NSC spaces, I'm in a SCIF and SCI SCIF. We work directly with Dr. Rice and her staff and mostly work global and large international type issues. National security issues work with NSA, CIA, and others on protecting those national security systems that are just as vulnerable as private sector systems. The other half of the office works directly with Governor Ridge and his staff, mostly from a physical protection point of view and those interdependencies I was talking about with the various sectors. We've also found that um, there are more vulnerabilities with the uh, borders around the United States. I'm sure you've seen these with the, the customs offices, the um, passport control offices, lots of things that we really weren't aware of until September 11th as to how poor us were. You could sort of draw a line from our office directly to the president because Richard Clark, who is our chairman, also is the special advisor to the president for uh, cyberspace security. First time any nation's ever actually appointed one person to be in charge of cybersecurity, so that relationship exists as well. When we were stood up, the President made it very clear. He did not want us to write new laws or regulations. He didn't want us to work in Capitol Hill, you know, find your local congressman and see if we can write some new laws to make cyberspace secure. What we really wanted to do was let industry drive this thing, let market forces uh, bring it to bear. But one way we could do that is the government spends millions, well actually billions if you do it over years, on IT, and particularly on IT security. So why not use our purchasing power to drive industry? And that, in fact, is something we're working with OMB um, and Mark Foreman and his e-government initiatives to factor in as much security as possible so we can drive the market to where it's almost a chicken and egg problem in order to get the vendors to build more security in their products. There has to be demand. In order for there to be demand, there has to be products that can satisfy that demand. So we think the government can make a big effort in moving that forward. We have many priorities, as you can imagine, with the strategy being the number one priority. But some of the other ones, I'll, I'll talk just one or two of these. The, the cell phone priority system was, again, a lesson learned from September 11th. Like I mentioned, if I, if I take my cell phone and I, I dial a phone call from here, I'm in competition with others here in the local area within you know, anywhere from a quarter to half a mile lead for some cell site, of which there may be 20, 30, 40, 50 channels available for phone calls. The phone company's research shows that those cell phone calls last about a minute and a half to two minutes. There's this number of cell phone users, and all this math comes together with how dense the cell towers have to be. But in times of a crisis, for example, the earthquake here in California, many people reach for their cell phones because they want to call loved ones or their office or whoever else. 
to see if they're okay to do this little instant communication that we've got used to. The cell system can't handle that. What we're experimenting with in Washington and in New York is a priority system. So I give to my uh, first responders the capability that their instrument, their actual handheld, can generate a priority tone that when a cell tower hears that, it will give them a channel. If all the channels are in use, it will wait till the first one gets disconnected, and it won't let that go to a paying subscriber. It goes instead to a first responder, somebody using the emergency system. Um, up to some limit, the FCC will not let us take the entire cell site. There has to always be something allowed for the general public. But it's a neat idea, and we're, we're finding in New York and Washington it's, it's working quite well. Fortunately, we've not had a national emergency yet or anything significant enough to see if it works. Um, maybe this winter when we get our famous Washington, D.C. snowstorms, we'll see uh, if that system comes together. You're probably aware of the fourth bullet down to Cyber Corps scholarships. I think that's affecting many of you uh, with uh, scholarships now to get uh, higher education degrees in InfoSec. But let me also mention the uh, Cyber Warning and Information Network. This is a, a very new program. We're building it right now. This will link together 75 network operation centers across the nation, 15 of which are government, the other 60 are private sector. Uh, places like Microsoft, AOL, <laughs> Cisco, Earthlink, um, Verizon, AT&T, Dell computers will be part of it. What we're looking at is not just the people who run the internet, the people who build products for the internet, software, hardware, etc. If there's a problem on the internet, for example, the problems we had with the DNS servers two weeks ago, CWIN is an out-of-band network. It's not part of the internet, and it's not part of the public switch networks. It runs completely separate and will allow us to continue to do communications in a time when the internet might be having routing problems or perhaps total failure. Um, this type of network has never been built before. It's so far, so good as we're building. It's been since the 1st of October. We've got five or six nodes already turned on. So far, so good. Right now, it's only domestic, but many of our international partners want us to extend it. So we're going to go to Canada this spring and possibly to Europe and Australia uh, later into next summer. If that works, we'll continue expanding perhaps to Japan and Germany, other economic partners. So let's talk the strategy. We'll get into the, the meat of what this is about now. I, there are many strategies that come out each year from the federal government, the two biggest ones being the national security strategy, and this year for the first time, a homeland security strategy. The national security one came out about uh, a month, six weeks back, and it focuses on the policies at a national level of how we deal with our adversaries. So you can download this off the website on whitehouse.gov. It's, it's an unclassified document. The, the biggest change in there was uh, before this current strategy, the way we did things was through deterrence. In other words, we build large armies, we have uh, occupation forces, you know, we have more nukes than they have. We generally just deter aggression. This strategy says not only do we do a deterrence, but we reserve the right to do preemptive strikes. This kind of supports this possible future war with Iraq. It says it is national policy that if we see a problem and we can't fix it through deterrence, we will then take the next step and preemptively the problem. The Homeland Security Strategy addresses all the problems that were highlighted on September 11th and creates an outline for what the Department of Homeland Security will look for. Both of these documents you really should get a copy of and read. They're both on whitehouse.gov. Um, they're not that long, 8-10 pages. <coughs> it's not really a sleeper, but do read it when you're awake because it, uh, they do get a little long. What's long, unfortunately, is our strategy. This thing has grown to about 60 some odd pages and we'd really like to be a little shorter. So our national strategy, being one of the many of these, focuses just on cyberspace security. It takes all of the lessons learned. This, this case I showed you coming up in the late 90s, lessons learned from September 11th, where we think the future of the internet is going, and brings it all into one document that provides this roadmap for everybody. Not just government, not just industry, not just home users, but pretty much everybody a way to become more secure, kind of to create a culture of security. We wanted to publish a final copy on September 18th, but the president wouldn't sign it. We went across the street to the president's office. He said this is too big, it's not presidential, it's not a short strategy like these others, we make it smaller. But what, what he suggested was why don't we just put it out for public comment. Have a 60 day comment period, which is what we're in now. Uh, period closes uh, September, or November 18th, which is next week. So. If you haven't already done so, please download a copy of it. Cybersecurity.gov is the place to go. Take a look at it. It's both PDF and HTML, so whatever your pleasure. And we welcome your input. And we really would like individuals to give individual input, not just corporate input or political activation, political groups or 
anything like that, individuals should uh, contribute as well. And keep in mind the cutoff is next week, so please get it in by the 18th. Let me walk through a little bit about what this strategy looks like. Keep in mind this is draft. The final version may look very different from this. We make a case, kind of like the case I was building here, built upon our vulnerabilities, our dependence on cybersecurity, all the things that come together. Why do we really need a strategy? And then from there, we go into the different types of approaches, the, the principles that guide us, and then five levels, starting at home users and going all the way to global. I'll touch on each of those levels briefly. Um, the case is very similar to what I just talked about. Cyberspace is part of us. We're very dependent on it. Many threats, scripties being a euphemism for young teenagers who have nothing better to do but uh, run uh, uh, hacking scripts written by others to break into computers all the way up to terrorists and nation states at the other extreme. <clears throat> a common theme that you'll see throughout the strategy, though, is don't worry about what the threat is, whether it's a script kitty or a terrorist, but focus in on what's wrong with your systems. You pretty much have the total knowledge of your vulnerabilities and your exposures. Spend time fixing those, not time worrying about where the next threat is coming from. The threats will manifest themselves the same way. They'll all use the same technical weaknesses in your systems to break in whether it's a script key or a nation state, so orient on the vulnerabilities. We also make a bold statement here at the bottom. I like to always point that out. The federal government has <laughs> never stood up and said that if there is something out there we cannot provide a safety net for. When we have Social Security, we have all these safety nets for everybody in America. We cannot build a safety net for cyberspace. It's just, first off, we don't have the expertise in the federal government. Second, we don't own cyberspace. We don't regulate it, it's not ours. It's a shared environment for many nations. And the cost of doing this would just be prohibited. So what we ask is everybody should secure their own corner of cyberspace, adopt this common kind of practices, work together to secure it, and don't look to just the government for it. For example, the, the level one users, the home users, predominantly that's the largest number of users on the internet, and the predominant problem is broadband today. Many cable DSL type users with always on connections, be they at home or be they at work. Computers that each year get faster and faster with more processing power, larger hard drives, more capability that as a group they can do damage. Focus in on applying patches, running virus software, uh, filtering out spam mail. There's, there's lots of things that are inside the first level. Kicking it up a notch, we look at large organizations. This would be corporate America where there might be an internal IT staff, or there might be a security team, but we need to get the level of awareness, this is what the strategy recommends, push it up to the board of directors, get the senior management of the company involved in securing the company, not just the geeks and the wizards that are down in the basement. This has been a problem in the past. It's always been a technical problem that the technicians worry about it, not a corporate problem like risk management. At the federal level, there are many critical sectors. I've pointed many of these out to you. All I'm showing you here is what affects us as federal government employees. But what we would like to do is use NIAF. That's the Information Assurance Partnership between NSA, the private sector, and NIST to create standards for secure products. We really would like to review that process and make it work better. And so that the federal government can, in fact, use certified products. We recognize right now that NIAF is not working as well as it should. It's a very expensive process. It does not give due diligence uh, to the open source community. Uh, products that go through NIAF tend to be all privately owned um, and with large dollars behind it. We also want to look above the industries and individuals at problems with the internet itself. Are there ways we can do BGP, Border Gateway Protocol, do it securely using SBGP? Can we take our domain name systems, the DNSs, and secure them? Can we do the same thing with IP security, with email, all the different types of ways we use the internet. There's language to that in the strategy. We also talk about our code of conduct. Is there best practices that we can develop? Can we get cable and DSL providers upstream from a home user to go ahead and firewall them off? You know, to block known viruses, known evil types of software. Is that a, a responsibility for those uh, broadband providers? And finally, what can we do with other nations? Can we extend this concept of information security that we're building here in the United States abroad to our partners and even to our adversaries. And what we're finding out is this culture of security actually is not that hard to do. Uh, just a couple weeks ago, there was a Asian Pacific Economic Council, APEC leaders meeting in Mexico City. Our, our president was there representing our country. And those APEC members agreed, first time we've seen this happen, that all the countries, everybody's unanimous across APEC, 
by this time next year, within one year, will agree to these three items that we have listed here. In other words, you're going to pass cybersecurity laws, making things like writing viruses illegal or uh, hacking into machines that are gaining unauthorized access, things that we already understand as being illegal in the physical world, we're going to apply those to the cyber side. We're going to create um, high-tech anti or, or um, high technology units, uh, cyber crime units, uh, points of contact that can speak cyber for foreign countries. And the real big one, this absolutely thrills me, is that we're going to get certs and cert teams in every country throughout APEC. These are the uh, computer emergency response teams of which CERT CC, I think Carnegie Mellon in, uh, in Pittsburgh is probably the best known. These teams can work with the government and the private sector to do some of this analysis and alert and warning for emerging threats. What you're seeing here is something nobody else has ever seen. This document was just written last night. I'm throwing it out at you in confidence. We've had this 60-day public comment period and this is kind of what's been coming back as a recommendation. I just showed you our existing outline. This is the direction we're thinking about going in. You can see that the flavor has really changed. No, not are we looking at five levels anymore that are home user, large users, etc. But we're kind of taking a different stamp at doing five different approaches to cyberspace security. Take a moment, look at this if you'd like. Unfortunately, I cannot leave a copy of it behind because it's an internal document. But I'll trust that you're not going to that camera off back there. <laughs> <laughs> you want me to? That's a, just keep in mind, this is an internal document, and this may also change also. But you can see the kind of the direction we're going in here. That we may not necessarily drill directly down into how to, how to secure a specific system, but tend to be a little more presidential and more strategic. So you, as a researcher in the InfoSec world, which I think many of you should think of yourselves as this way, also has a role in this process. How do, how do I become a player? Well, we all know how the internet came about. It was an academic effort, military effort. We're linking together computer systems. We're not worried about security. Um, but if we build this thing, what responsibility does the research community have to securing it? Is it proper for you to build it and then walk away from it? And that's somebody else. Now granted, you as individuals didn't build it, but as a collective group of people who are in this academic world, we're all responsible for it. Part of what we have to ask, though, is how do you secure the internet? What, what, we'll get to the definition of security in just a moment, but what does it mean by securing it? Is it things like accounting for all addresses? Should we move to IPv6? Should this be a national priority? Or is IPv4 okay forever? We would really welcome your comments and your thoughts on that. How do you do things like uh, trusted routing, trusted naming conventions, where we can not corrupt naming files or routing tables? How do we get PKI working? Big question. Do we need PKI? Is it okay in the world that we're in with that? We also look at best practices, uh, engineering security and the software from the start, not as an applique or, or later add on patch. Certification, information sharing always comes up. And then we go back to the question of what is security? How do you define it? Can you define it? Are there numbers you can put on security? Or is security just a concept? And we'll know it when we get there. But don't ask me to define it or put numbers on it. Uh, the uh, NSA definition orients a lot on the, the CIA model, confidentiality, integrity, and authenticity. That is an approach to security. Other approaches tend to look at unauthorized disclosure or prevention of intrusions. That's security. There may be other ways of defining security. We would welcome your thoughts as to how do you actually put a definition on it. And what about open source software? Many of us deal with this on a daily basis in the academic community. Is it secure? Or is proprietary software more secure? Well, the government's take on this is we're not going to, we're not going to stand on either side. Both are secureable in our mindset. The question is really up to the developers. How secure do you want to make it? There's plenty of cases where open source has been found to be vulnerable. There's plenty of cases where proprietary has been vulnerable. So until one emerges as never having vulnerabilities, we really can't say which is more vulnerable than the other. What the government, of course, relies on is my app. And I understand if some of you have to start going to class, so I'm about two minutes away from wrapping up. Please get to leave my We have to use my app inside the government, and we should be using my app. My app takes a look at IT product, software, hardware, evaluates them, and tries to make sure that we have different security levels built into the software. We can certify it with EAL, one, two, three, four, all the way up to seven. And then we buy off that list. But something interesting about my app is that the tool that they use to evaluate products is an open source tool. It's not a proprietary tool. So is their tool secure? 
or is it been broken into? We all know that's that's a, a valid question. Let me show you one or two final slides, and I'll take a few questions until we run out of time. I took a survey of .gov and .mil computers, pulled this off of Netcraft, and come to find out that there are more Apache users, government websites, than Apache, than there are Microsoft. In just a second. Well, not too just far enough. And this number continues to grow. So why is the government using Apache if Apache is not on the NIAP list? Well, it turns out IIS is not on the NIAP list either, nor is Netscape or Lotus or any other web server. None of them are on the NIAP list. It, just, it, it seems that Apache, because it's free, the cost of Apache is what's driving its use. If I go down to .mil, you'll see Microsoft still maintains a very strong over 50% usage across .mil, but that number is also slowly coming down, particularly due to Microsoft's licensing agreements and the cost of renewals. Many commands are looking at that and saying, that's a cost I cannot absorb. I'll just use that free software called Apache. But don't think that just moving to Apache because it's open source makes you more secure. Apache has just as many problems as IIS. But both are secure of all and built properly. Again, I'm going to hammer home. Security starts with each of us. It's an individual responsibility. Collectively, we can make this thing work. We can't really rely on one organization to do it all for us. And you individuals who are here studying at uh, NPS, you can help us. There are many things you can do for us, uh, individually or collectively, to raise this bar of cyberspace security. Please give us feedback on the, on the strategy. Call me if you'd like, if you've got some interest in it. If you're ever in D.C., drop in. We'll give you a free tour of the West Wing. Whatever it takes to get your interest going so that you can help us in this, uh, this battle. Here's my contact information. Uh, phone number's at the bottom. I'll be sure to leave my email address behind you guys. For those of you who can read Fortran, those are on Fortran statements. <laughs> uh, I think we've got about maybe five minutes or so uh, for questions. Anybody? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, you said you didn't want to get into laws and regulations, but if somebody, somebody's hackers attacked me, they might be proactive that they got laws for me to attack them back. I mean, okay, what would you do to them? Well, I, if I knew enough, I'd send them a Trojan horse to, to help identify themselves. Would you access the Trojan horse? Would send an email to the FBI okay. and say, I live here, come arrest me. Would you access them in an unauthorized manner? Yes. And you just broke the law. <laughs> Um, yes, the way the law is written today is unauthorized access is what it's keying in on. Not saying that what you're doing isn't fair, and there are many people who 